Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for coming. There is no peace for the wicked, which is quite a well-known saying. I imagine you've heard people say that before. Um, sometimes they mean different things by it. Sometimes they just mean, oh, they're so busy in life, there's so many things to do, there's no peace for the wicked. Or sometimes they say there's no rest for the wicked. It's a common thing people say. And it's a phrase from the Bible. Now, it's not a phrase from the chapter we read as an introduction, but we'll get to the, the place it occurs in the Bible later. Another phrase that sprung, springs to my mind when I hear um, no peace for the wicked is the counterpoint, which you often see like on a stereotypical gravestone would be RIP, rest in peace. Um, and there's that kind of picture of people resting in peace, perhaps good people resting in peace, and the counterpoint of no rest for the wicked. And that is a kind of theme. I wanted to see what the Bible said about that. Um, so that's why I picked Psalm 37 as an introductory chapter, because I think for that general theme, what does the Bible have to say about the futures of the righteous and the futures of the wicked? I think Psalm 37 um, states that quite plainly and quite nicely. So in a way, I wanted that to be the foundation of where we're starting from today. And then we'd want to look at um, where that phrase occurs elsewhere in the Bible, no peace for the wicked. So if we start in Psalm 37, just to get the foundation of what does the Bible say about um, the futures of the righteous and the wicked, then the psalmist sets it out. He repeats it lots of times through the chapter, really. Um, now, one phrase again, that's a common phrase that you could spot in this chapter, in verse 11, um, the meek shall inherit the earth, or in my translation, the meek shall inherit the land. So that's a phrase that Christ picks up in the New Testament, and it's become a well-known phrase um, in the English language generally as well. Now that phrase there, the meek shall inherit the land or the, the earth, is repeated in some form um, about five times to this chapter. Um, so in verse 9, the end of verse 9, those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Verse 11, as we read, the meek shall inherit the land. Verse 22, those blessed by the Lord shall inherit the land. Verse 29, the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. In verse 34, uh, the Lord will exalt you to inherit the land. So that's the, the future of the righteous, if you like. There's promises in the Bible about the future of the righteous and it is a future of peace. It's a future of uh, inheriting the land. It's a, a future of God's kingdom on the earth. And the counterpoint in this chapter is all the things it says about the future of the wicked. So, um, the, the various statements made through the chapter. So, verses 1 and 2. Um, Fret not yourself because of evildoers, nor be not envious of, evil, of wrongdoers. For they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. So there isn't a future for the wicked. And that, that is repeated several times through the chapter. Uh, verse 9, for the evildoers shall be cut off. Verse 10, in just a little while the wicked will be no more. Uh, verse 13, the Lord laughs at the wicked for he sees that his day is coming. Um, if we skip near the end of the chapter, or halfway through I guess. Um, the end of verse 28, the children of the wicked shall be cut off. Verse 34, uh, wait for the Lord and keep his way. He will halt you to inherit the land. You will look on when the wicked are cut off. Verses 35 and 36. I have seen a wicked, ruthless man spreading himself like a green laurel tree, but he passed away, and behold, he was no more. Though I sought him, he could not be found. So the contrast there is the wicked man has no future. He'll be cut off, and he'll be no more. Um, just death. And again, verse 37, the contrast. Mark the blameless and behold the upright, for there is a future for the man of peace. But transgressors shall be altogether destroyed. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. So for the righteous, there's a future of peace. And for the wicked, um, they are cut off and life ends. So as a foundation, I think chapter 37 is uh, an ideal chapter to set the foundation of what is the future of the, the righteous and the wicked according to the Bible. And that summarises the basic principles, if you like. But it doesn't use the phrase that we, we want to look at today. Um, there is no peace for the wicked. So where does that phrase occur? And that occurs in the book of Isaiah. And it occurs twice in the book of Isaiah. So to set the scene, who was Isaiah? When was he speaking? Uh, so if we go to chapter 1 of Isaiah, just to set the scene before we get to the phrase. Then Isaiah was a prophet uh, in Judah and Jerusalem. So verse 1 of Isaiah 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, 
which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So Isaiah prophesied for quite a long time. He overlapped with four kings. Um, three of those kings were good. Uzziah and Jotham were summarized in the books of Chronicles as um, being good kings. Uh, Ahaz was summarized in, as a bad king, and Hezekiah as a good king. So if you want to read about their lives in Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles 26 is about Uzziah, 27 is about Jotham, 28 about Ahaz, and then 29 about Hezekiah. Um, so three good and one bad. So Isaiah is prophesying during that time, and that's quite a long time before um, Judah. This is in the, the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. It's quite a long time before they ultimately went into captivity by the Babylonians. But it overlaps. Sometime during Isaiah's time was when the northern kingdom were taken into captivity. Um, so he would have seen the northern kingdom taken away, but it would have been after his lifetime that the southern kingdom was taken into captivity. So Isaiah um, talks about various things, and he, he prophesies about that captivity. So later on in Isaiah, um, he speaks about the Babylonians coming and taking Judah captive. And he also speaks about the return from captivity. So he speaks about prophetic events beyond his life. Now, Isaiah is quite a long book. There's 66 chapters in it. And it's fairly common. I mean, if you look up something like Wikipedia about Isaiah, what does it say about it? And it's a fairly common viewpoint that Isaiah is not by a single author, that it's by more than one person. And I think that's because people find it hard to rationalise that Isaiah is speaking about events in the future. So some people think, well, there must have been an author that was around during the early part, and somebody else must have written the later parts, because Isaiah, how could he have known the future? Um, so that's quite a common um, idea about the book of Isaiah. And it's quite common to split Isaiah into, say, three sections. So um, some people think that chapters 1 to 39 are by one author, chapters 40 to 55 perhaps by another, and chapters 56 to 66 by another. So that's one viewpoint. Um, personally, I think that the whole of Isaiah was more likely to have been written by one person called Isaiah. And that's the, the, the position of the gospel writer in John. So in John chapter 12, John quotes twice from Isaiah, once from relatively early in Isaiah, and once from relatively late in Isaiah, and comments that they're both by the same person. So in John 12, um, if we go in at verse 37, John's speaking about Jesus. Though Jesus had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And then this quotes from Isaiah chapter 53. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, for again, Isaiah said, this time Isaiah chapter 6, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so they did not be put out of the synagogue. And John carries on with the point in hand. But just the point I want to pick out there is that John is picking out an early chapter of Isaiah and a late chapter of Isaiah, and in passing he happens to mention they're written by the same person. So that's how I understand the book of Isaiah to be written by the same person, Isaiah, but speaking about prophetic events about Babylon that were beyond his own lifetime. So what does he say about Babylon? Well, if we're back in Isaiah, then he recounts events. So the first chapter is starting out um, messages to Judah and Jerusalem. So this would be during his lifetime, things he would say to Judah and Jerusalem. And then once you get to chapter 39, there's a passage there where he's specifically speaking about Babylon. Chapter 39. Now let's read. Um, let's, well, we could, it's a short chapter. It's only eight verses. So let's just read it to get what, what Isaiah is saying. Chapter 39. At that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that he had been sick and had recovered. So this is during Hezekiah's reign, the last king that Isaiah prophesied during the reign of. And Hezekiah welcomed them gladly, and he showed them his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his whole armory, all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. 
Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say, and from where did they come to you? Hezekiah said, They have come to me from a far country, from Babylon. He said, What have they seen in your house? Hezekiah answered, They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that, that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house, and that which your fathers have stored up till this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you will father, shall be taken away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Then said Hezekiah to Isaiah, The word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought, There will be peace and security in my days. So Isaiah is giving Hezekiah a message about Babylon eventually uh, taking captives from, um, from Judah and ultimately the whole nation being taken into captivity. So there's a message there about the future, about Babylon taking Judah captive. But if you go on a few chapters more, chapter 47, then there is a message about Babylon and about Babylon's downfall. So Isaiah 47 now. Verse 1, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit in the ground without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for you shall no more be called tender and delicate. Take the millstones and grain flour, pull off your veil, strip off your robe, uncover your legs, pass through the rivers. Your nakedness shall be uncovered and your disgrace shall be seen. I will take vengeance and I will spare no one. Our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, is his name, is the Holy One of Israel. So a message to Babylon about... Um, judgment that was coming on them uh, and this continues over say the next chapter speaks of a similar thing um, chapter 48 chapter 48 and into verse 14 assemble all of you and listen who among them has declared these things the Lord loves him he shall perform his purpose on Babylon and his arm shall be against the Chaldeans I even I have spoken and called him I have brought him and he will prosper in his way. So um, briefly stopping there. Um, it's going to, God is saying he's going to perform his purpose on Babylon and the Chaldeans, another name for Babylon. And then in verse 20, go out from Babylon, flee from Chaldea, declare this with a shout of joy and proclaim it, send it to the end of the earth, say, the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. So here a prophecy about Judah being taken back from captivity in Babylon. They're going out from Babylon, fleeing from Chaldea. So a prophecy about Judah returning from Babylon. So this is part of Isaiah's message about the future. And at the end of this chapter, there's the first occurrence of the phrase that we're interested in today. So if we carry on, verse 21, they did not thirst when he led them through the deserts. He made water flow for them from the rock. He split the rock and the water gushed out. So he's reminding them of things that happened during their exodus from previous captivity in Egypt. Um, and then summarising the chapter, there is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. So that's when the first occurrence of that phrase appears. So what does Isaiah mean by that? Well, is that what he's saying, summarising Babylon's ending, there is no peace for the wicked? perhaps um, so maybe maybe that's what he's saying whereas Judah is being redeemed by the Lord of course Judah were um, not perhaps the best example of righteousness themselves um, but maybe it's a lesson to Judah that God is going to do this to Babylon therefore don't be like Babylon there's no peace for the wicked so that's the, the first occurrence the other occurrence is in um, Isaiah 57 Isaiah 57 In this chapter again it's a contrast between the righteous and the wicked So at the start of the chapter The righteous man perishes and no one lays it to heart Devout men are taken away while no one understands For the righteous man is taken away from calamity He enters into peace they rest in their beds who walk in their uprightness. So in a way that is similar to the, the alternative phrase that we had at the start about resting in peace. Here a message about the righteous. Um, there is a future, of, even when they're dead, there is a future of peace promised for them. 
So that message about the righteous at the start and then going on to talk about the wicked. Verse 3, But you draw near, sons of the sorceress, offspring of the adulterer and the loose woman, who are you mocking? And it talks about the, the wicked for a, a lot of the rest of the chapter. And at the end, um, it finishes with verse 20, The wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. So perhaps in this chapter, Isaiah is also commenting on the difference between the righteous and the wicked and the futures for them, and there's no peace for the wicked. Now, the reason I wanted to set that against the sort of foundation of Psalm 37 is because Psalm 37, if you like, is a much more straightforward statement of um, the, the Bible's message about the righteous and the wicked, but it's entirely consistent with what Isaiah is talking about. So, We've got this, the righteous and the wicked and their futures. The future of the righteous man is assured, a future of peace, and the wicked will be cut off. Now, if we go back to something early, if we go back to Exodus 34, how does this fit into God's character? Because this is God's plan, if you like. But if we look at God's character, then we can see that um, this dealing with the righteous and the wicked in this way, this justice is intrinsic to God's character. So in Exodus 34, we have the Lord speaking with Moses. Um, so Exodus 34, verse 1, The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write in the tablets the words which were on the first tablets which you broke. So this was preparing the set and set, set of tablets that God is going to write his commandments on. And at that time, God declares his name, his character to Moses. So if we go into um, verse 5. The Lord descended on the, in the clouds. So this is at the top of the mountain. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there, with Moses, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. <clears throat> so, God there proclaiming his character to Moses. And two of the key things there are, well, about justice, how God deals with the righteous and the wicked. Um, uh, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness keeping steadfast love for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin but who by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation so in a way the, the goodness of God it talks about um, steadfast love for thousands whether that's for thousands or is that a, a comparison with, with the wicked to three or four generations whereas for the righteous it's is it thousands of generations or just thousands of people? But clearly God is more keen to, to bless than he is to curse. But God is a God of justice and there's both those aspects there. Now, the statement here that God makes can be misunderstood in a few different ways. And some of these are addressed by some of the writers later in the Bible. <coughs> Now, the first possible misunderstanding is um, when God talks there about delivering justice on subsequent generations, does that mean that God's judging the children for the father's sins? So if someone happens to be born to a good father, is he blessed purely because of who his father was? Or if someone happens to be born to a bad person, is he judged purely because of who his father was? And that's something that comes up later in the Bible. Um, is God judging the children for the father's sins. Now, that's, it's most clearly dealt with in Ezekiel. If we go to Ezekiel 18. <clears throat> then Ezekiel's message is that everyone's responsible for their own actions. 
So, in a way, the, there's no peace for the wicked. It's, it's the wicked that is responsible for his actions, or there's blessings for the righteous. It's the righteous that are responsible for that. You're not being judged on someone else's um, bad behaviour. It's your own bad behaviour that you're judged on, or good behaviour. So, Ezekiel 18, the whole chapter is worth reading. Um, we'll pick a few bits out of it. In fact, we might, we might read quite a, a large portion of it, but we'll pick bits out of it. So if we're going at the start, Ezekiel sets forward the, the problem. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by, the repeated, by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The children have eaten sour grapes, and the, sorry, the fathers, the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. So that's basically stating that misunderstanding. Are the children judged for the sins of the fathers? And then the answer, as I live, declares the Lord, the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father, as well as the soul of the son, is mine. The soul whose sins shall die. So people are responsible for their own actions. And then it's, it's laid forward quite straightforwardly. If a man is righteous and does what is just and right, if he does not eat in the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbour's wife or approach a woman in her time of menstrual impurity, does not oppress anyone, but restores to the debtor his pledge, commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with a garment, does not lend at interest or take any profit, withholds his hand from injustice, executes true justice between man and man, walks in my statutes and keeps my rules by acting faithfully. He is righteous, he shall surely live, declares the Lord God. If he follows a son who is violent, a shedder of blood, who does any of these things, though he himself did none of these things, who even eats upon the mountains, defiles his neighbour's wife, oppresses the poor and needy, commits robbery, does not restore the pledge, lifts up his eyes to the idols, commits abomination, lends at interest and takes profit. Shall he then live? He shall not live. He has done all these abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall be upon himself. So if you have a good man, he will be he'll, that promise of blessings, the promise of peace, he would receive if it's a, a wicked man, then the judgment on that, he'd, he'd receive justice. And it didn't matter what his father did, it was on his own actions. And that's kind of repeated through the, the next passage. Well, what happens if that man fathers a, a son who sees his bad actions and he turns from them? Well, that's good. And the additional um, message in this chapter is the one about um, what happens if you have a wicked man who turns from his ways and then starts to do what is right. So, verse 21. If a wicked person turns from all his sins that he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of the transgressions that he has committed shall be remembered against him. For the righteousness, for the righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? So, a message there of repentance. If somebody is a wicked person, but he turns from it, well, he's no longer counted as that. He's counted as being righteous and the promise of life for that. And vice versa, 24. But when a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice and does the same abominations that the wicked person does, shall he live? None of the righteous deeds that he has done shall be remembered for the treachery of which he is guilty and the sin he has committed, for them he shall die. So it works both ways. If you turn from one side, then if you turn from the wickedness, you're, that's good. If you turn from righteousness, that's bad and you'll be judged for it. So set forward quite plainly here that it's personal responsibility, if you like. We can't blame other people for um, what we do. So that's the first possible misunderstanding from Exodus 34, that God is a God of justice. He's not unfair. And it is, we are personally responsible for our own actions. Another possible misunderstanding is, well, surely that means if bad things happen to people, they must be bad people because God is judging them. So that's quite a common thing that people sometimes um, say. I remember some years ago now, I remember Glenn Hoddle got fired once as a football manager because he, his understanding was that if a disabled person must have done something wrong to, to deserve that. So it was, 
a kind of doctrine of karma, that bad things happen to bad people. Is that what God is saying here? Are people judged in the short term for their righteousness or wickedness? And they're not, and that, again, is something that is laid plain in the Bible elsewhere. So let's look at... Well, there's a few places this occurs. Um, you could do a full study of the book of Job, and I think that misunderstanding arises there because Job, a righteous man, and terrible things happen to him. And his friends assume, well, you must, you must not be a righteous man, you must be a bad man, and God is... Um, judging you in the short term for your wickedness and they were mistaken in that that was not why these things were happening to Job that's a long study though um, a, a more brief sort of outline of the problem could be in Psalm 73 where actually the psalmist is observing the opposite. The psalmist sees that wicked people are not judged in the short term, that often he sees wicked people prospering and doesn't understand why this is. There's, there's not a short term um, judgment. So Psalm 73, we'll just jump in at verse three. I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongues struts through the earth. Therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them and all the things they do. Verse 12, behold... They are the wicked, always at ease, the increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence, for all day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. So he sees the wicked prospering, and there is no short term judgment that that is not that God doesn't work like that. God doesn't judge the wicked immediately for the things that they've done. And the psalmist is observing this and is distressed by it. Verse 16. When I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. He's distressed by it. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. <clears throat> so, in the sanctuary of God, he sees something which makes him think and understand what the issue is. So, what might he have seen? Now, <clears throat> probably what he might have seen in the sanctuary of God, if you go back to number 16, you'd read about Korah's rebellion. And Korah had tried to displace Moses and take over if you like and the, they were Moses dealt with the problem by praying to God and God told him how to deal with it and the, the people of the rebellion had to present their censors before the Lord and see whether their offering was acceptable and they weren't, God punished them and actually the, there was an earthquake and the ground followed up and swallowed, swallowed Korah, so Numbers 16 if you want to read the whole story, sorry Numbers 16 um, around, around that time but what would David or the psalmist have seen in the sanctuary that reminded him of that? Well, the gold from those censers was told to be used in the sanctuary. So in fact, number 16, just a couple of verses from there. Number 16. So after the... After the, the the judgment events has happened. Verse 36. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Tell Eliezer the son of Aaron the priest to take up the censers out of the blaze, then scatter the fire far and wide, for they have become holy. As for the censers of these men who have sinned at the cost of their lives, let them be hammered into hammered plates as a covering for the altar, for they offered them before the Lord, and they became holy. Thus they shall be a sign to the people of Israel. So the altar was covered in the gold, from this rebellion as a reminder of the wicked come to an end and ultimately they, they will be judged but not necessarily in the short term so a couple of potential misunderstandings from um, that description of God's character the children don't die for the father's sins personal responsibility but it's not an immediate short term judgement it's long term how God is going to judge people in the long term So, back to Isaiah. 
a few things to wrap up. So we're looking at Ezekiel there about um, Ezekiel explaining about the um, the soul whose sins shall die, personal responsibility. And Ezekiel also had that message of repentance and forgiveness. Now Ezekiel was speaking at a later time than Isaiah, but Isaiah spoke about the same things. So Isaiah 55. has the same message of um, repentance and forgiveness for those who change their ways. As I 55, we're going at verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So the same message there that was in that chapter in Ezekiel, that although there is judgment that's um, to come on the wicked God doesn't want it to be like that he wants the the wicked to turn from their ways and God wants to have compassion on them and God wants to forgive him but there has to be a response from the individual to to want that forgiveness, to want to change his ways so that, that message is consistent between Isaiah Ezekiel and the rest of the Bible it's the same message that John the Baptist had Uh, I'm sure there'll be other talks here on John the Baptist that would cover this but John the Baptist's message was one of repentance you need to change your ways um, and God wants to have compassion on you God wants to forgive and John's message was all about how um, Christ was the the method by which that worked that Christ was the, the sacrifice through which that worked but there's other talks here that will cover that in more detail the principle for now is there's judgment for the righteous and the wicked but God would rather give the blessings to the righteous than the judgment on the wicked so we'll have one more passage to finish still in Isaiah since the original phrase comes from Isaiah if we go to chapter 11 when is God going to do this? we've said it will not be in the short term as in God doesn't immediately punish us when we are wicked or immediately reward us when we are righteous. So when is God going to to do this? And it's an event that's still in the future. So the, the righteous, as we saw earlier, the righteous sleeping in their beds are waiting for this to be fulfilled. It hasn't happened yet. And Isaiah 11 um, is a prophecy of the time when that judgment would happen and the rewards would be given or the punishment given. It's a prophecy of Christ. If we read Isaiah 11 from the the beginning, from verse 1, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Verses speaking about Christ. Verse 3, And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or dispute, decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. So a description there of Christ as the judge, the one that dispenses the judgment on the righteous and the wicked and when would this be what's what's the time like well let's carry on verse 6 we get a description of the kingdom this peace the the, the meek shall inherit the, the land the righteous shall inherit the earth a description of that time now in verse 6 onwards the wolf shall dwell with the lamb the leopard shall lie down with the young goat and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf together and the little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So we have this picture of Christ as the judge. We have this picture of the kingdom age and it is a picture of peace Um, not just peace between humans but nature at peace animals the wolf and the lamb 
when was the last time you saw a wolf and a lamb lying down together? Even animals are at peace. Children, um, as you might appreciate, we find it quite difficult chasing toddlers around. Toddlers get everywhere. You can't, it's very difficult keeping toddlers safe. Um, we don't even have, people then wouldn't even have to worry about this. Um, the nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the adder's den. A, com- a time of complete peace where you don't even have to have any concern for the safety of a toddler who gets everywhere. <clears throat> they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So that's the, the promise of the the ultimate um, judgment, if you like, and this the time of the blessings, then this is the time of peace. When will that be? It's not in the short term, but I don't know when it is. Well, maybe it's in the short term for now, but judgment is not in the short term from the wickedness or the righteous acts. But when will it be? I don't know the answer to that, but I'm sure there are other talks here that will talk about present events, perhaps, and when is Christ coming will be, what things should we be looking for. But the, some of the events in the rest of this chapter describe some of the things that would happen. In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. In that day, the Lord will extend his hand yet a second time to recover the remnant that remains of his people from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathor, Pathros, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the coastlands of the sea. He will raise a signal for the nations and will assemble the banished of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So perhaps events immediately following um, the establishment of this kingdom, this is Christ regathering people to the the land of Israel, perhaps um, a further remnant of Israel that hasn't been regathered yet. There's still many um, Jews living throughout the world, um, perhaps believers, but it's a a description of a physical kingdom on earth with people being regathered to the nations and the surrounding nations as those listed in verse 11 seeing this happen it's a physical kingdom on earth now as I say we can't go into the details of how all that works tonight but that's something that hopefully will be covered in various other talks here the topic for tonight really was what is the future of the righteous and the wicked and there's promises there. There's promises of peace for the righteous and judgment for the wicked. And there's an eagerness from God and from the writers of the scriptures that he wants us to turn from our wickedness and wants us to be um, part of the righteous. Now, it's not unobtainable because we'll never manage it, but God is so eager for that that he's willing to overlook. When it talks about the wicked turning from their righteousness, God wants to overlook things. And again, further talks might consider how that is done through Christ. But a final positive note to end on is that description of the time of peace. Verse 9, They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea.